Thanks for coming. And it's sad uh, for me because it's the third and final lecture. COVID Immers has given a dazzling set of lectures. I've learned so much, been so uh, challenged and provoked. And um, we've had two marvelous dinners, and we'll have a third uh, marvelous dinner, mm -hmm. I'm sure, even despite the snow. Mm -hmm. but anyway, thank you for not only for accepting our invitation, but as we say, for showing up. I mean, really for <laughs> engaging the material, engaging our lane lock, and teaching us all something new. So please give it up for the COVID. Thanks. And now, COVID will be introduced by my dear colleague, a uh, fellow at the Voice Institute, and professor of English, Conflict, and Gender Studies at UCLA, Jenny Sharp. Okay. Thank you, Skip. It is such a pleasure to be introducing Corbett Emerso, whose work I have long admired. An internationally renowned scholar, Corbett is professor of history of art and African American studies at Yale University and has taught at New York University, the University of California, Santa Cruz, and Goldsmiths College, University of London. Now, I must also mention a very brief stint at, uh, as a visiting professor in art history at UCLA, not only because it's my own campus, but, but also because it was in LA that Kobener gathered the essays he wrote in London, putting them into what he described as a suitcase for traveling theory. His now classic 1994 book, Welcome to the Jungle, New Positions in Black Cultural Studies. Its contents address such diverse cultural issues as black masculinity and the sexual politics of race, black gay image making, the aesthetics of black independent film, the politics of black hairstyles, all of which, as he explained to me the other day, have a visual component. And you'll see why this is important in terms of the trajectory of his work. Now, the early 90s were, were an era when the uh, cultural production of people of African, Caribbean, and Asian descent traveled across the water from Britain to the United States. The music of Sade, Soul to Soul, Tricky, the art of Sonia Boyce, Keith Piper, Lubyama Hamid, the fiction of Salman Rushdie, Carl Phillips, and Hani Kurishi, and the films of Isaac Julian, John Akofram, and the Black Audio Film Collective. I mentioned this vibrant cultural moment because Kovina was not just writing about it, but helping shape it through his collaborations, conference organizing, essays on black aesthetics, and the cultural politics of diaspora. His writings do not provide a right on cheering voice to invoke Stuart Hall's cautionary words about black cultural politics in the essay, New Ethnicities. When addressing how Julian's young soul rebels, and I'm quoting Kobina now, unwittingly replayed the very narratives it set out to subvert, Kobina concludes that, and I quote again, if you do not rewrite the master codes of race relations narrative, then the codes will try to rewrite you end of quote. <laughs> While these words, appearing as they do in a footnote, can be considered mere marginalia, they speak to Kobano's own work as a constant and ongoing rewriting of the master codes of race relations narratives, as we've been seeing in this room. Now his collaborative, I want to mention his collaborative work because I think it's equally uh, transformative and we're not encouraged to collaborate, but he, again, is right at the center, particularly in the early years. The edited collection in which Hall's New Ethnicities first appeared consisted of the presentations for a 1988 film conference Kovanel organized at the Institute of Contemporary Arts in London. The conference brought together film practitioners, theorists, and critics for articulating the complex relation between the categories of black and British. A few months after the conference, Kobano, together with Julian, edited a special issue of Screen called The Last Special Issue of Race. And for those of you who are not old enough uh, to remember that moment, let me tell you, these two particular works make a huge splash, huge splash. Uh, and I had copies on my bookshelf and cherished them until today. Their co-authored introduction, The Margin and the Center, which has also been anthologized, uh, explains that there would not be a need for a special issue if race and ethnicity were central to film, film studies. Representing a turning point in film studies, the special issue was perhaps prescient in its pronouncement. Kobina's own publications are so extensive that, that it would be impossible to name them all within this allocated time. 
uh, for the introduction. So let me just mention, I want to mention his monographs on uh, James Van, Van de Zee, Isaac Julian, Keith Piper, his edited series, Annotating Arts Histories, whose titles include uh, Cosmopolitan Modernisms, uh, Discrepant Abstraction, Pop Art and Vernacular Culture, and Exiles, Diasporas, and Strangers. And again, you could just see the enormous range that he brings uh, to the work that he is doing. More recently, Coburn has been involved in consolidating the late Stuart Hall's memory through the editing and writing of an introduction to Hall's previously unpublished 1994 uh, Du Bois lectures, published by Harvard University Press last year as The Fateful Triangle, Race, Ethnicity, and Nation, and uh, the foreword is written by Skip Gates. Coburn has, uh, he also has a 215 essay, Stuart Hall and the Visual Arts, explaining the centrality of visual culture to Hall's theoretical writings. And it's an essay I found particularly useful for my own understanding of Hall's work. His most recent book, Travel and Sea, Black Diaspora Art Practices Since the 80s, published by Duke Press, uh, University Press in 2016, contains 18 essays written over a period of 20 years between 1992 and 2012, picking up where Welcome to the Jungle left off. Its title alludes to a proverb Kobana saw carved on a boat in Ghana. And I quote him from, from the book, where to travel and see is to adopt an outward looking attitude that ventures out into uncharted realms so as to put one's curiosity to the test. Travel and See extends the idea of traveling theory of his earlier book with the suitcase being traded for a boat. <laughs> Addressing black visual cultures on both sides of the Atlantic and not just in Britain, it recounts the journey by which African American, black British, and Caribbean artists have contributed to the transformation of art in an age of globalization. Although the lectures we have been hearing in this room address an earlier period of the modern than his book, they share with Travel and See a methodological approach of rewriting the master codes of art and blackness to tell a story of global, cross-cultural, and cross-racial entanglements. Please join me in welcome, welcoming Professor Coberno Mercer to the podium for his third Cohen lecture entitled Endlessly New Negro. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my thanks to Jenny for that uh, introduction. In fact, Los Angeles uh, is a very special place in my map of diaspora because it's the very first place in the United States that I visited. This was in 1986. There were a contingent of us, about 12, 15 of us, that came over from London for a gay, a lesbian and gay people of color conference that was held at the Ambassador Hotel. So uh, Isaac Julian was one of my fellow travelers as well as my sister. Uh, Araba Mercer. She worked at the Black Lesbian and Gay Center in Haringey. And so meeting people like Joseph Beam, uh, a couple of years later I met Marlon Riggs, was really all part of that uh, experience of the uh, Black Atlantic as a living reality, not just as a theoretical abstraction. So that's continued to grow uh, in terms of the hospitality that I've received uh, in numerous contexts. And um, actually, in that spirit, I'd like to dedicate this last talk to the memory of Marlon Riggs, who is a very dear friend. OK, so as you've probably noticed, I've changed my title a little bit. So brilliant. That's the best title <laughs> I have seen in a long, long time. Thanks. So was Locke's homosexuality a factor in his commitment to the visual arts? The problem is not yes, but how. I know that's not quite grammatical, but I think you know where I'm going with this. The problem is not yes, but how. So philosopher Leonard Harris was the first to raise the question in his 2001 essay, Outing Elaine Locke, in which he decried what he saw as the silencing that rendered sexual identity irrelevant to Locke's scholarship, even though there was common knowledge of Locke's same-sex identification in the form of anecdote, hearsay, gossipy stories. The open secret is pernicious, and on this front, Harris is absolutely right, because it sets up a structure of disavowal. Like the emperor's new clothes or the elephant in the room, everyone knows that it's there, but the iron rule is that no one talks about it. So what remains unspoken, or more to the point, unspeakable, thus becomes all the more decisive in perceptions of the person who is made to carry the open secret. <clears throat> 
With this year's publication of Jeffrey Stewart's epic biography, The New Negro, The Life of Elaine Locke, this double bind has been pulled apart, it would seem. Stewart has not only taken up the humanistic challenge that Harris laid down by giving us a holistic portrait that integrates Locke's sexuality into his life's work as a philosopher, an arts activist, an institution builder, and an intellectual leader. But in addition to this, Stewart has also set Locke's personal friendships and his professional alliances in the broader context of black LGBT contributions to the Harlem Renaissance as a whole. As one of Locke's foremost scholars, Stewart edited the 1983 anthology, The Critical Temper of Elaine Locke. And this was important because it made primary sources available at a time when the post-black arts movement reading of Locke, one thinks of Harold Cruz's The Crisis of the Negro Intellectual and Nathan Huggins's Harlem Renaissance that was published in 1971, took a very harsh view of the 1920s, a judgment that was often based on the view that Locke's culturalism was partly to blame. Stewart's 2018 biography then represents a major turning point, giving us a fully inclusive picture of the new Negro's pluralistic blackness. Stewart helps us understand that queers who are fully part of their communities, and I can't help but think of James Van Der Zee's portrait of a Harlem drag ball attendee, that photograph from 1926. That queers who are fully part of their communities came to be silenced in the respectability politics of the 1940s and the revolutionary politics of the 1960s before returning into visibility in the 1980s in artworks such as Isaac Julian's Looking for Langston of 1989. But the question with which I began concerns precisely the limits of biography. On the face of it, it seems to be common sense that if sexuality is integral to the life that one is studying, then biography is where we need to go in order to understand the part it played in the making of the work. But doesn't that commit us to a pre-Foucauldian understanding of sexuality as the source of an individual's inner truth, a view in which sexuality becomes the decider in everything that Locke said and did? In such confessional constructions of sexuality, where inner secrets function to guarantee epistemological access to the truth of a subject's identity, the heightened attention that we pay to sexuality can itself become oppressive, reducing every aspect of someone's uh, life and thought to one singular explanatory determinant. In light of the open secret that has haunted our received image of Locke, my concern is that when the unspoken acts as a lure that incites our interest in uncovering something that will lay bare the ultimate truth, the attention that we pay to biography may in fact detract from our understanding of the work. So after the life ends, the work lives on, or rather the work stands a chance of living on whenever it is cited, whenever it's kept alive by structures of citationality that the author himself could not have foreseen. To draw on another Foucault, the Foucault of what is an author, we could distinguish the author name, which refers to the finite life of a singular individual. That was Elaine Leroy Rock, born uh, Locke, born 1885, died 1954. Distinguishing the author name from the author function, which refers to the knowledge claims, the propositions, the inquiries, and all other forms of statement making that are based on citations of Locke's work whether they were published in his lifetime or whether they're in his manuscript archive. So theoretically speaking, I'm not saying anything new, but to the extent that biographically driven attention to Locke's life can, in my view, get in the way of understanding the contemporary relevance of Locke's philosophy of culture, my concern in these lectures is to de-biographize Locke, as it were, by highlighting the pragmatist precepts that he acted upon as a public intellectual. And as we've seen, putting ideas into action, the Harlem Museum of African Art Initiative really tells us more about the racialized and asymmetrical conditions of modernism in the 1920s New York art world than anecdotes, biographical anecdotes about Locke's relationship to Charlotte Osgood Mason, the eccentric art patron who Locke befriended, who supported Aaron Douglas, Langston Hughes, and Zora Neale Hurston, but on condition that they played the primitive. And as we saw yesterday in The Negro in Art, cross-cultural relationships curated on the page 
which prefigured a model of diasporic cosmopolitan, uh, cosmopolitanism in Locke's Museum Without Worlds may not have come to light if a biographical focus gave precedence instead to Locke's alleged favoritism or the gender bias within that led Zora Neale Hurston uh, on her part to slam, quote, the malicious, spiteful little snot that thinks he ought to be the leading Negro because of his degrees, end quote. So call me Sister Killjoy, but the entertainment value of such biographical tidbits is a huge part of the problem. When we bear in mind Foucault's point that an author is neither the absolute origin nor the final arbiter of the meanings that circulate in discourses generated from the author function, what we might call the Lockean text, and that the author name is always a variable and contingent projection in terms more or less psychological of our way of handling texts. That's from what is an author. We soon find that the flip side of biographical interpretation is not so much fun. By all accounts, Locke was very close to his mother, Mary Locke. To the extent that biography encourages psychologizing readings, we might say that Locke's professional relationship with senior white women decision makers, such as Charlotte Osgood Mason or Mary Beattie Brady, Brady, were identificatory surrogates that were forged in the aftermath of his mother's death. But the more prevalent reading of the wake that Locke held as part of his mother's funeral, which has circulated as a set piece in biographical readings, is one that tends to pathologize Locke as the homo boy child who failed to overcome his pre adipal attachments. And this, in turn, gets elided with his homosexuality. Stewart's scrupulously researched study gives us a deeply sympathetic portrait. Yet when Locke is depicted as a mama's boy, I wonder whether the psychologizing impulse speaks precisely to the projections that Foucault referred to, that is to say, our fears and fantasies as readers, rather than the early 20th century conditions that lesbian and gay people of color faced in negotiating their circumstances. So in counterpoint, I want to acknowledge the very important questions that Stuart asks. Why was Locke constantly on vacation, touring European cities at every opportunity, visiting friends, looking for love, or maybe he felt like cruising? These are some of the answers that Stuart put forward, demonstrating that the travel that galvanized Locke's diasporic consciousness also involved lines of flight from restricted spaces in which being outed would carry disastrous consequences. Also, a homosexual who was accommodated to the closet might reasonably fear. So I want to explore another way of answering my initial question by stepping aside from the biographical. Locke's sexuality is indeed a factor in his philosophy of culture, I suggest, but insofar as he brought the discourse of gay aestheticism into a cross-cultural intersection with social race, as he called it, in his cosmopolitan conception of culture citizenship. There's a handwritten note in the archive in a folder labeled autobiographical writings that strikes a rather gloomy note when Locke writes of the, quote, Achilles heel of homosexuality. In such self-analysis, it seems that he saw his homosexuality as a source of weakness to be, quote, kept in an armored shell of reserve and haughty caution, end quote. Yet, in contrast, there's a wry sense of humor that we hear in a letter of October 1st, 1949, that Leonard Harris cites, in which Locke describes himself, self-deprecatingly, as susceptible to different forms of oppression because he's a member of three minorities. Quote, had I been born in ancient Greece, I would have escaped the first. In Europe, I would have been spared the second. And in Japan, I would have been above rather than below average. Hope to make the point in the following way. Referring in this last instance to his height as a man who stood four foot 11, and there we see him third from the right, uh, and he's standing uh, on a step, as you can see. Referring to his height as a man who stood four foot 11, his witty self-description is co-present with the earnest indirection of saying something without actually naming it. Had he been born in Europe, he would have been spared anti-black racism. Born in ancient Greece, he would have escaped anti-gay prejudice. 
Walter, standing with fellow uh, directors and advisory board members of the Encyclopedia of the Negro, which was published by the Phelps Stokes Fund between 1932 and 45. Locke, as we can see, is very much the dapper dandy. But even as his smart double-breasted suit provides him with that armored shell of reserve and haughty caution, our challenge is to track the co-articulation of culture as a focal concern that he shared in common with fellow African-American intellectuals. There's Du Bois uh, in the front, right in the middle, standing next to um, Ernest Kinkle Jones, with James Weldon Johnson uh, to his left. And there's also Arthur Schomburg, you can see, sort of third from the uh, left in the second row. How he co-articulated the conception of culture that was of common interest to this generation of African-American intellectuals with culture as an identity building medium amongst late 19th century homosexual artists for whom art for art's sake was implicated in its own kind of bid for culture citizenship. So in his 1873 book, uh, Studies in the History of the Renaissance, Walter Pater put forward coded readings of homoerotic desire in works by Michelangelo and Leonardo producing a canon for what we would call today a gay sensibility that extended to Pater's consideration of correspondence by Winkelmann, the 18th century art historian, in which Pater discerned not just a disinterested love of beauty, but also what he called the subtler threads of temperament, which was, as one contributor to last year's queer British art exhibition put it, a code, although not a very veiled one, for same-sex desire. And temperament, as Stuart picked up earlier on, is very much a Lockean word. So from the 1890s onwards, homosexual artists revisited Greco-Roman classicism in scenes that exalted the male nude. We see this in Baron von Glodden's photographs of Sicilian youth, in the paintings of the British artist Henry Scott Tuke, and there's also a return to pre-Christian sexual morality that's there in Walt Whitman as well. But in the newfound homoerotic idiom by which the archaic and pagan past was revisited, the classical themes that gave value to Greco-Roman aesthetic ideals were now no longer under the exclusive ownership of normative assumptions that had hitherto underwritten their canonization in Western art history. For the 24-year-old's Rhodes Scholar, this is uh, Locke at uh, uh, our left in 1908 in Britain. For the 24-year-old Rhodes Scholar, Pater's view of life as a stream of, quote, unstable, flickering, inconstant impressions. Pater's view was that we live in a flux of sensation in relation to which a cultivation of a desire for beauty through alert observation is what counteracts our human transience. All this, I suggest for this 24-year-old, offered a perspective on the arts that added to, that augmented Locke's growing commitment to cosmopolitanism. Biographical studies rightly draw our attention to the Cosmopolitan Club, formed at Oxford in 1907, as the setting in which Locke's friendships with Pixley Isaac Asim from South Africa and also Lionel de Fonseca from Ceylon, as it was then, shaped his internationalist understanding of race relations. And focusing on culture as a verb, it's the practice of self-cultivation that is Locke's focal concern in an unpublished essay from this period that's entitled Cosmopolitanism and Culture. And a consideration of it enables us to see how the dandiesque self-fashioning that's captured in that 1908 portrait went hand in glove with the anti-assimilationist standpoint that he arrived at in his notion of value contrasts. So in this essay, where Locke begins on a relativistic note, quote, cosmopolitanism will be the intellectual courtesy by which other people's contrasted ideas will pass as of equal worth with one's own, end quote. In starting on that relativistic note, he was rehearsing, quote, the idea of the need for cultural reciprocity, as Harris and Molesworth point out. And this was not a abstract prescription, but this was the very basis for Locke of concrete self-fashioning. 
for in the essay's last sentence he declares, quote, cosmopolitan culture then, if it is to be truly cultivating, is a sense of value contrasts and a heightened and rationalized self-centralization. So when he described his Oxford years in a 1914 report on the Harvard class of 1908, there is more than a hint of Wildean irony when Locke conveys the anti-assimilationist outlook that he acquired as a result of traveling outside the US. Saying something all the more pointedly by not saying it directly, he declared, quote, in the midst of a type of life that is a world type, one had every facility for becoming really cosmopolitan. It was a rare experience in the company of foreign students to pay Englishmen the very high tribute of not even attempting to be like them but to be more oneself because of their example. And Oscar Wilde is even more tangibly present, sotto voce, but unmistakably being cited some 10 years later. This is in a 1923 uh, lecture to Howard Freshman. Uh, it's entitled The Ethics of Culture, where his emphasis on self-cultivation is now framed not as a matter of individuality alone, but of collective belonging and group identity in a racially stratified context. So we're moving forward now to 1923, in which he says, a brilliant Englishman once characterized America as a place where everything had a price, but nothing had a value, referring to the typical preference for practical and utilitarian points of view. There is a special need for a correction of this on your part. As a race group, we are at a critical stage where we are releasing creative artistic talent in excess of our group ability to understand and support it. End group. End quote. So in what is essentially a pep talk, Locke's best foot forward approach reconciles the individual and the group by stressing that, quote, a group which expects to be judged by its best must live up to its best so that they may be truly representative. And he concludes, quote, personal representativeness and group achievement are identical. Ultimately, a people is judged by its capacity to contribute to culture, end quote. So where Locke's stress on self-cultivation understands culture to be something that you do, as opposed to noun-based conceptions of culture as a collection of things that you own, we can see how his early thinking, with his emphasis on self-cultivation, focused on the agency that in gay aestheticism had appropriated Greco-Roman classicism for gay identities that were now being further developed, uh, one might say contrapuntally developed, with this notion that race as a unit of social thought could be subjected to reappropriation in the context of early 20th century African-American culture. So in that context, to come back to the US context specifically, one might say that in a racially structured society governed by the discursive convention, whereby black voices gain admittance to the public sphere only one at a time, the representativeness that was being emphasized in the 1923 talk was not just Locke's concern, but an abiding concern among generations of African-American public intellectuals who, in the eyes of America's white majority, were held to the expectation that they were speaking on behalf of an entire population that was otherwise denied access to a public voice. But now, we've arrived at a vantage from which to reframe the vexed question of Locke's perceived elitism. Holding his cosmopolitanism together with his aestheticism, integrating, in other words, black and queer conceptions of culture as a realm in which belongingness and citizenship are at stake in self-cultivation, we arrive at a fresh angle from which to reassess the dynamic tensions that enlivened Locke's practice as a public intellectual. Where homosexuals challenged their energy into the arts via aestheticism, they were not countering stigmatization by making a bid for equality, as if to say gays are as good as you, so much as they were accentuating Greco-Roman aesthetics with a kind of inverted snobbery, as if to say in a codic, uh, coded homoerotic idiom, we are different from you. On this view, what we find beneath the stern judgmentalism of Locke's public persona as a cultural critic, what we find behind the armored shell of reserve and haughty caution, is a cross-cultural transposition of the principle whereby the self-reinvention of the queer aesthete, held true also for the new Negro project, 
in which the African-American quest to redeem, sorry, to quote, redeem, to rescue, or to revise race as a unit of social thought, as he put it, in race contacts and interracial relations, would take place primarily in the realm of culture, more so than in politics or the economy. So before coming to back to the concerns that Nancy Fraser expressed regarding the primacy of culture in Locke's critical pragmatism, I'd simply make the point here that once we integrate Locke's uh, homosexuality into his outlook as a theorist of culture and society, we need to recognize that the gay identities that we are dealing with were as historically constructed as the black identities that reconstituted themselves from old to new Negro. Locke understood that culture is not a second order phenomenon that reflects or represents identities that have already been constituted in social and political life, but that culture is a first order phenomenon because it's the medium in which ongoing processes of identity transformation take place. So Locke mentored the sculptor Richmond Barté uh, in his professional life, throughout his professional life, as we see in the film still, which is from uh, 1933, uh, film produced by the Harmon Foundation, The Negro and Art. And in this still, we see uh, Locke mediating between the artist and a white gallery visitor. And their personal correspondence indicates how Locke supported Barté as one black gay man to another especially when romantic relationships did not work out as hoped. So biographical sources, I concede, can enrich our understanding immensely, as Margaret Van Dries demonstrates in her 2008 monograph on Barté, showing that the mutual support was important at many moments in both of their careers. Although I would also add, if we look at uh, Barté outside the property he purchased in Jamaica in 1949, I would also add that it's equally important to notice that Iolus, the name that he gave to his house, uh, which he owned from 49 to 69, is itself an outcropping of gay aestheticism. For Barté was citing Edward Carpenter's 1917 anthology of friendship, which was named after Hercules' closest friends but which was itself a coded statement of same-sex identification, which we see here now cross-culturally transposed into colonial Jamaica by an Afro-modern appropriation from ancient Greece. Portraying Locke as the Proust of Lennox Avenue, David Levering Lewis gives us a very different take. Reading the 1923 freshman lecture, where the Howard professor said, quote, the highest duty uh, the highest duty is the duty to be cultured, end quote. Lewis, this is writing in When Harlem Was in Vogue in 1979, interprets high-minded elitism rather than a call to self-cultivation. Quote, his Howard University colleagues never forgot the wake held in his apartment in the early 1920s. He had served them tea while the embalmed remains of his mother sat in her favorite armchair. That's how we find Locke portrayed with an evocation of morbidity that then runs into the open secret that's inscribed in the next sentence. Professor Locke had a weakness for his male students and for intelligent males in general. So when Harlem was in vogue, it was the first to offer a capacious survey of the era. But as Lewis stages a set piece in the biographically oriented literature, uh, namely Locke's unrequited affair with Langston Hughes in the summer of 1924, uh, we find further problems arise. Even as the recourse to nudgewink innuendo succeeds primarily in trivializing the philosopher, one wonders whether this way of characterizing Locke's uh, emphasis on the primacy of culture, a framing that merges homosexuality and elitism along with characterizations of pathology, whether this approach in the biographical literature is really trying to manage an ambivalent set of feelings with regard to the intellectual leadership that Locke embodied as a black gay man. One might say that on the one hand, his leadership is something to be admired by the black public, for in taking culture so seriously, Locke won recognition and respect for blackness in a segregated society. Yet on the other hand, such a vanguard role on the part of the black queer who is pouring their energies into the cultural realm would also be a source of anxiety 
For if the race leader, the representative, turns out to be gay, how will that affect the way in which blackness is perceived in the eyes of white society as a whole? So I'm simply asking the question of whether that ambivalence is what motivates that tendency in the literature to focus on these set pieces, the wake, the unrequited uh, affair with uh, Hughes. Where open secrets bundle such ambivalence beneath the threshold of the speakable, it would, in my view, be unhelpful to take a psychological response that thinks of this as a problem of homophobia. For what we're dealing with is really a hermeneutic problem of interpretation. On this latter view, the problem of elitism that is undeniably present in Locke's cultural criticism is better framed by the bigger question of how the concept of culture itself undergoes an epoch-defining shift from the start to the middle of the 20th century. And this is a shift that Locke himself took account of towards the end of his career. From the 1890s to the 1920s, there are very few artistic or intellectual movements that did not think of themselves as elites, whether we're focused on the um, talented 10th or the Salon de Autonome. Popular culture, as we define it today, only becomes an object of inquiry at mid-century in response to the entrance of the masses onto the stage of politics and history. In the sense that cultural studies distinguishes two definitional approaches, culture as a collection of artifacts created over the course of civilization and culture as a whole way of life on the part of social groups. Locke's early positions in the 1910s and 1920s can be readily aligned with Matthew Arnold's top-down rendering in which culture is, quote, the best which has been thought and said, even though at the same time Locke was an early adopter of Boas's anthropological approach to the study of collective patterns from the bottom up. And it is this Bosian perspective that informs his 1930s writings on the contribution of black folk culture to American national culture, and which underpins his views on intercultural reciprocity in the 1940s. If Matthew Arnold's position in Culture and Anarchy of 1869 was defensively elitist, seeking to preserve an aristocratic notion of what it meant to be cultured on the basis of, quote, European models of high culture, of Europe as the universal subject of culture. And this is me quoting Stuart Hall. And of culture itself in its old Arnoldian reading as the last refuge of culture against the barbarians, against the masses rattling at the gates, end quote, then we would do well to bear in mind two things. One is that modernism as a whole begins to take shape in the 1890s by modeling itself in the image of quasi-aristocratic elites. The dandy, after all, is a liminal figure whose aloof detachment signifies his non-belongingness to either the landed gentry nor to the mercantile bourgeoisie. And the second point uh, here is for us to also notice that even as Locke inhabits a dandiesque pose, which in performative terms is just that, a pose, a stance, a way of looking at the world that could be changed through practices of self-cultivation, his pragmatist thinking pushes him against the grain of defensive elitism. Locke's anti-proprietorial thrust gives us an emphasis on the processes of cultural contact, which means that the products of culture can never be under the exclusive ownership of any one single group identity. So I've just now cited Stuart Hall's What is this Black in Black Popular Culture? For when we recognize how the 20th century splits with elitist definitions in the first half then being displaced by democratizing counter-definitions after the 1940s, we realize that in much of the literature on Locke, we're coming up against an anachronism whereby his philosophy of culture is being judged from the point of view of a political understanding of cultural forms created by, for, and about the lived experience of blackness that only took definitional shape in the 1960s black arts movement. Richard Wright, amongst others, had taken the lead in the 1940s in criticizing elitist models of black culture. Yet when the unfavorable post-1960s assessment of the Harlem Renaissance damns its elitism, we lose both the specificity of Locke's historical moment, 
which is the early 20th century that, again, to continue with Hall, includes America's ambivalent relationship to European high culture and the ambiguity of America's relationship to its own internal hierarchies. And we also lose sight of the dynamic nuance that is the common thread connecting Locke's thinking on the sociology of race in his 1916 lectures to the contributionism of his 1930s cultural criticism, all of which leads to the distinctive insights on the 1940s into the composite character of African-American culture. So what gets buried by the open secret is really a broader understanding of the cultural history of modernity. Whereas, by approaching Locke's era through an intersectional lens that recognizes the agency of appropriation in gay and black cultures alike, we arrive instead at a framework for understanding how culture served as the medium in which historically subaltern subjects began to make modernities of their own. So within the context of his biographical account, Jeffrey Stewart comes at the matter in a revealing way. Instead of casting Locke's unrequited relationship with Hughes in an unfavorable, pathologizing light, Stuart details the circumstances whereby after their parting in Venice, Locke traveled separately to San Remo, where he came up with the first drafts of Enter the New Negro. Unlucky in love, certainly, but in contrasting the temperaments of the two men, Stuart gives us a fresh context for understanding the genesis of the New Negro concept. And he writes, Locke and Hughes held to different theories of culture. Hughes felt his art would testify to the dignity, the genius, and the genuineness of the poor of any culture, but especially the African-American. For Hughes, culture began and ended with the masses. Locke, on the other hand, believed that although art grew out of the soil of the working class experience, the best art and culture was that which evolved through discipline, learning, and purification to become sophisticated art. So having the two men personify different conceptions of culture gives us a contrast that is perhaps a little bit too clear cut, especially when Hall reminds us that, quote, the contents of what is high and what is low change from one historical moment to the other. The important point is the orderings of culture that open culture to the play of power, not an inventory of what is high versus what is low at any moment. And because power is the one key question that goes missing in Locke's philosophy of culture, it's indispensable for us to hold in mind Hall's cultural studies conception of culture as an open space of contestation, a space in which values and meanings are brought into conflict and struggle in a medium that is structured like a language, such that signifying elements can be disarticulated from prevailing codes and rearticulated to produce new meanings and altered values. By definition, I'm continuing to quote Stuart Hall, popular, black popular culture is a contradictory space. It's a site of strategic contestation. But, Hall continues, it can never be explained in terms of simple binary oppositions that are still habitually used to map it out high and low, resistance versus incorporation, authentic versus inauthentic, experiential versus formal, opposition versus homogenization. There are always positions to be won in popular culture, but no struggle can capture popular culture for itself. Sorry, but no struggle can capture popular culture itself for our side or for theirs, end quote. To say that we never hear such language of culture as a battlefield, a site of agonism in Locke's writings, is not to judge the latter on the basis of what it lacks, but to ponder how it is that despite the maddening evasion of conflict in Locke's thinking, his avoidance of the material inequalities that govern structure and agency in the field of cultural production, how it is that despite that, the process-oriented conceptualization of the new Negro links up nonetheless with Hall's cultural studies model of cultural identity as that which remakes itself, reinvents itself by recomposing signifying materials that are made available to historical actors first and foremost in the commons of culture. So it is to Nancy Fraser, who comes from a Frankfurt School background as a theorist of the public sphere, that we owe the reading of Locke as a pragmatist. This was introduced yesterday. Where Jeffrey Stewart made the 1916 lectures available as a primary source, Fraser showed that Locke came back from his study years in Europe with, quote, a remarkable combination of intellectual influences. 
a Joycean tendency to cast what appeared as differences of kind as differences of degree, a Jamesian view of an open pluriverse of human possibilities, and a conception of cultural pluralism that served primarily to contest the Americanization of US immigrants, but that could be extended to the struggle against racism." End quote. Where Locke's Oxford encounter with Horace Kalin, who laid claim to cultural pluralism, is indeed another set piece within the literature, Fraser made the all-important point that Locke's anti-assimilationism with regards to US race relations was forged through his anti-imperialist views that he acquired as a participant with other international students in the Cosmopolitan Club. Hence, quote, like Kalin, like Randolph Bourne, John Dewey, Locke was concerned, this is Nancy Fraser's voice, Locke was concerned with the regulation of group difference in 20th century America. Unlike them, however, he did not understand the problem as one of harmoniously orchestrating the cultural difference of immigrant groups, a view largely irrelevant to Negroes and to the struggle against racism. Rather, Locke understood difference in light of power, domination and political economy. Thus, unlike the pragmatist mainstream, he grasped that a dominated group might need to forge a cultural identity as a weapon of struggle against oppression." End quote. And forging cultural identity was precisely what the Harlem Renaissance accomplished. One might find it remarkable that nine years before the Civic Club dinner of 1924, Locke had already theorized culture as the medium in which a social group historically oppressed by the category of race could contest the old Negro of ascribed identity by producing cultural forms whose aim was to, quote, redeem, to rescue or to revise the meaning and value of race as a unit of social thought. And it's not that one wants to doubly inscribe Locke in prophetic as well as pragmatist traditions, yet it's crucial to point out that when he concluded his 1916 lectures with a reference to, quote, uh, Celtic and Pan-Slavic movements in arts and letters, movements by which the submerged classes are coming to their expression in art, that seem to be forerunners of that kind of recognition which they are ultimately striving for, namely recognition of an economic, a civic and a social sort, Locke was never arguing from topical observation. He had arrived at his model of cultural pluralism in which arts in the arts and letters form a future-facing field capable of prefiguring possible transformations, not on the basis of observation, but by theorizing race. He saw it as a category that was meaningless in its own right, but which, having acquired meaning only historically to justify the political economy of empire, could be seized upon to generate alternative meanings by those formerly oppressed by it. However, none of this interests Nancy Fraser. Quote, history proved Locke wrong, she concludes. Again, to co continue with her quote, the extraordinary flowering of black cultural production he envisioned and promoted did not serve to win civil and political rights. Only mass political struggle directly confronting the racist state could do that. Notwithstanding the theoretical sophistication of Locke's pragmatist anti-essentialism then, it was not he, but the Hegelian Du Bois who understood this, end quote. So like those coming from a post-black arts movement angle, who similarly judged the new Negro of the 1920s to be a failure, Fraser seems to assume a reductively cause and effect relationship between culture and politics. But what if Locke was reaching for a more complex relationship one in which the subjects of history stand a chance to break out of oppressive discourses, not by inventing new languages for themselves ex nihilo, but by turning around and appropriating the dominant discourse with signifying idioms and counter discursive accentuations of their own. A question which simply doesn't arise for Fraser. Following her exposition of the pragmatist precepts by which Locke, uh, Locke demystified blood race, his term, and cleared ground for his analysis of social race, Fraser poses questions that rightly get at the problem of why the political seems to drop out of Locke's cultural criticism. She asks, why then does he propose to redeem the idea of race and overcome racism through the creation of Negro literature and art? Why propose a cultural remedy for a political harm? Why cultural production instead of political struggles? 
But the either or logic that we heard put into play when culture is thought of as something put forward instead of political struggle betrays a residual base superstructure determinism in Fraser's ham-fisted Marxism that also reveals a pre-discursive and pre-cultural studies outlook offering no recognition of the constitutive role of language, discourse and culture in constructing the positions from which we act and are acted upon as social subjects. One might say that before they make political decisions, before they make economic calculations, subjects act on a sense of identity that comes not from any unchangeable inner essence, so Hall and Fo uh, Foucault would argue, amongst, along with most humanities fields that have also undertaken the discursive turn. But identities that come from the symbolic universe in which the meanings and values mobilized in subjecting identities to domination, oppression and power are opened to contestation in counter discourses of negation, resistance and empowerment that also circulate discursively. To say the new in New Negro produced a new identity position on the basis of redeeming, rescuing, revising and re-signifying the category Negro, a category that for over 400 years made blackness a signifier of absence, lack and negativity in the symbolic order of Western culture, is to say that Locke's philosophy of culture did not just anticipate constructionist methods, but anticipated discursively constructionist methods. To posit culture as a composite formation, one permanently susceptible to the reconfiguration of its constituent elements, is to lay out a perspective in which the elementary units and building blocks of culture as a verb are best understood as signifiers, even though, as I've acknowledged, all indications of discursive antagonism remain missing from Locke's account. They have left the building. Listening to Stuart Hall address the production of new subjects in history, and I'll quote uh, presently from the 1997 Princeton conference that Waniba Lubiana organized that was published as The House That Race Built, we need to hear the emphasis that Hall places on tradition, not as a guarantee of political outcomes, but as a cultural resource for political struggles that is structured like a language in the sense that a tradition makes the past available to the present and the future through discursive acts of citation. So this is Hall. Could one imagine the civil rights struggle of the 60s without the long traditions of black struggle that historically go back at least as far as the beginnings of slavery? And yet, is there anybody here who wouldn't, who wouldn't want to describe the civil rights movement as a movement that produced new subjects. But what is that new then in light of the tradition? Would it have happened without that tradition? Where would traditions of struggle have come from if there hadn't been languages and historical traditions of one kind or another that sustained human beings in their lives of struggle across time? And yet the particular way that black people occupied that identity, lived that identity and struggled around it, produced something which had never been seen before, end quote. So turning to a 1949 text by Locke entitled Frontiers of Culture, which was delivered as a speech to a Howard University fraternity, which makes it a pendant to the ethics of culture uh, talk of 1923, we should listen out, in light of what we've just heard Stuart Hall say, we should listen out for the theoretical principles that stand behind the conversational tone of Locke's talk. Delivered some years before he died in 1954, Frontiers of Culture clarifies Locke's position on three important facets of his thinking that may not explain his aversion to antagonism, conflict and struggle but which demand consideration if we're to leave with a fully rounded view of his early 20th century culturalism. So I'm going to quote from this 1949 Frontiers of Culture. Far be it from me to disclaim or disparage a brainchild, but in my view, if a new Negro is not born and reborn every half generation or so, something is radically wrong, not only with the society in which we live, but with us also. According to this calendar, we should have had at least two new Negroes since 1925, end quote. For a pragmatist who always began in media res, the new Negro was never a one-time deal. It was never conceived in terms of a simplistic before and after narrative. Since Locke has made it clear that culture is not a noun, it's a verb, 
It's an ongoing process in which potential for transformation, for making and remaking new and newer identities, comes from citational and appropriational activity of revising, resignifying, and reusing what has been made available in language by past traditions. Throughout his study, Jeffrey Stewart emphasizes precisely this process of perpetual reinvention. Were we to think of the self-renaming from Negro through colored or black, from Afro-American to African-American, we would readily agree with the implication of Locke's view that these are not interchangeable labels for a fully finished essence, but are markers of differential subject positions, indicating modes of being on the part of the black subject that, found that, that find their counterpart when homosexual, gay, and queer are likewise similarly thought of as differential subject positions created through historical struggles in the medium of culture. So in a tone that's both witty and caustic, as I warned you, I cannot be too pleasant at the expense of the truth as I see it, Locke was looking back in 1949, judging the Harlem Renaissance as something that in his view, quote, failed to accomplish all that it could and should have realized. He continues, quote, having signed that new Negro's birth certificate, I assume some right to participate in the post-mortem findings. In sum and substance, that generation of cultural effort and self-expression died of a fatal misconception of the true nature of culture. Both the creative talent of that day and its audience made culture a marketplace commodity. And out of this shallow and sordid misunderstanding did it to death prematurely. Two childish maladies of the spirit, exhibitionism and chauvinism, became epidemic, and the basic health of the movement was thereby sapped." End quote. So his critique of the market seems moralistic rather than materialist, but we may answer the question of why Locke was not citing Adorno and Horkheimer's Frankfurt School analysis of the culture industry by pointing out that the 1944 German text was not translated until the 1970s. And in any case, as a political liberal whose cultural tastes were lower case conservative, Locke had never really been in dialogue with Marxism to begin with. But even as he judges the 1925 New Negro harshly, as he does his own role in authoring it, Locke adds to his critique of the market and to his thesis of perpetual self-making a third and crucial emphasis when he says, quote, the movement was not promulgated as a movement for cliques and coteries or for the parasitic elite, but it was a movement for folk culture and folk representation, eventually even for folk participation. Ultimately, it was hoped it would be by, for, and of the people. It was democratically open to all who might be interested on the basis of collaboration and mutual understanding." End quote. Indeed, it's this democratizing commitment that informs the idea of service that Locke enacted as a public intellectual, all of which is encapsulated in the metaphor that he chose at the start of this 1949 talk, where he defines the primacy of culture, culture comes first, in the following way. I do believe that though not vital, culture is nevertheless an essential. In fact, after its achievement, it always had and always will rank first, though I am common sense enough to admit readily the basic importance of bread, with or without butter. I too confess that at one time of my life, I may have been guilty of thinking of culture as cake contrasted with bread. Now I know better. Real essential culture is baked into our daily bread, or else it isn't really truly culture. In short, I am willing to stand firmly on the side of the democratic rather than the aristocratic notion of culture, and have so stood for many years, without having gotten full credit, however." End quote. So summing up the credo that he put into practice throughout his life's work, which is, quote, to propagate the culture democratically, to help it permeate ordinary living, to root it in the soil of group life, to profess it as a folk rather than a class inheritance, end quote, Locke is revealing the democratic and the aristocratic to be aspects of his own composite formation, however much we, for our part, still tend to think of the two as mutually exclusive.
1930, the contribution of race to culture starts as follows, quotes, um, there has always been an almost limitless natural reciprocity between cultures. Civilization, for all its claims of distinctiveness, is a vast amalgam of cultures. The difficulties of our social creeds and practices have risen in great measure from our refusal to recognize this fact. And in this essay, we hear a voice that's offering a solution that seems to be as idealistically appealing as it seems unrealistically untenable. It's one thing to argue, as Locke did in 1930, that, quote, culture goods, once evolved, are no longer the exclusive property of the race or people who originated them. They belong to all who can use them and belong most to those who can use them best. So it's one thing to say that, but it's quite another to conclude, as he does, quote, do away with the idea of proprietorship and face the natural fact of the limitless interchangeableness of culture goods. And we have, I think, a solution reconciling nationalism with internationalism, racialism with in universalism. And yet while Locke scholars point to the flaws and inconsistency to be found in such idealistic tendencies, the question for me is whether these are flaws worth working with if we want a deeper understanding of the cultural history of modernity. To hear Locke say in that same 1930 article that, quote, America appropriates as classically American the cultural products of Negroes while de denying them civic and cultural equality, end quote, is to register the sheer frustration that he gives us no structural framework with which to develop that insight. And yet the concept of appropriation, as he's describing it just now, is fully operative in the 1916 text earlier, when Locke seized on race as a category to be rescued, to be redeemed, and to be revised. Starting in 1928 and running off and on until 1952, Locke published annual reviews. This was first of all in Opportunity magazine and then it continued in Phylon. Viewed through a narrowly biographical lens, such an endeavor might be seen as the grade sheet, the annual grade sheet of a provincial schoolmaster awarding prizes and punishments. Alternatively, when we read the ongoingness of this commitment as the work of a process-oriented pragmatist building a future for African-American studies and Africana studies. As we touched on yesterday, cultures cannot grow if everyone agrees. Judging not for the sake of judging, but to grow the culture, um, but to grow the culture that is made more robust by constructive criticism and principled dissent, Locke disseminated some of his richest insights in this body of work, these annual reviews, which surpass uh, the act of mere reviewing. His titles were always choice. 1934, it was the 11th hour of Nordicism. 1939, the Negro, new and newer. And in another nod to Oscar Wilde in 1950, it was wisdom de profundis. But for me, who or what is Negro of 1942 clearly wins out. In this essay, having established that, quote, neither national nor racial cultural elements are so distinctive as to be mutually exclusive, it is the general composite character of culture which is disregarded by such oversimplifications, end quote. The hyphenated designations with which he ends, arguing that Afro or Negro American should be the term we use, for this is a hybrid product of Negro reaction to American cultural forms and practices, led Locke to state, quote, there is, in brief, no the Negro, end quote. Dispensing with the definitive article, which, in his view, leads, if soundly developed, not to cultural separatism, but to cultural pluralism, he concluded to be Negro in the cultural sense is to be distinctively composite and idiomatic. So as I bring these uh, lectures to conclusion, I want to outline an understudied aspect of 1920s American modernism that is in its own right distinctively composite and idiomatic as a case in point. So I began two days ago with a scene of Afro-modern self-questioning in which from Jules Latimer Allen's photographic portrait of James Lecessney Wells to Malvin Johnson's self-portrait of 1934, the signifying chain that put face and mask together in African-American ancestralism was, I suggested, a dialogic trope 
that began to trouble straightforward representational claims to identity. And in light of the interpretive crossing of black and gay points of view in today's account of Locke's cosmopolitan conception of culture, I want to ask whether we see something similar in Carl Van Vechten's photographic portraits showing sculptor Richmond Barté, singer, musician Billie Holiday, and novelist Richard Wright, all holding African objet d'art. And these are but three instances of an entire strand in Van Vechten's portraits that concatenate face and mask in ways that seem to double back on the ambivalent structure of feeling, intimately attracted and yet also confronting something opaque and enigmatic that we previously saw in the hands of African-American modernists. Identitarian thinking often entails a somewhat anachronistic stance uh, when it wants the past to be as egalitarianly inclusive as we still want our 21st century futures to be. This is a somewhat anachronistic stance that would have a hard time reconciling the fact that, uh, um, that Locke and Van Vechten, for all they had in common as homosexuals, were really chalk and cheese. Van Vechten was very much the exhibitionist in Locke's terms. The exhibitionist whose self-promoting claim to fame was his standing as the exceptional white person who felt comfortable and at home amongst the blacks that he befriended. While Locke, for his part, the buttoned up dandy that he was, guardedly covered himself, as we've seen, in an armored shell of haughty caution. Van Vechten was given a camera in 1932 by Miguel Covarrubias, and in the work that he produced as a result of this, it's as if he atoned for the atrocious novel that he'd produced in the 1920s. For after all, he went on to produce a portrait gallery that remains the unparalleled image archive of both the Harlem Renaissance's cast of characters and indeed of the 20th century Pan-African diaspora to core. Continuing through the 1940s and 1950s, Van Vechten's portrait gallery was attuned to pluralistic blackness, including boy swimmers at Harlem's outdoor pools, as well as celebrities from Harry Belafonte and Ella Fitzgerald to Du Bois and C.L.R. James. Although we need to notice that in segregated fashion, Van Vechten kept his portraits of white American modernists quite separate. To say this archive is still awaiting the intersectional attention that it deserves, that will build on the insights that Jonathan Weinberg, for instance, brought to Van Vechten's homoerotic scrapbooks that were produced for private viewing, is to say that once we move on from a biographical interpretation, Locke's anti-proprietorial notion of culture encourages us to rethink the priority that is conventionally given to authorial precedents. So if we're Starting from a person-centered, identity-based point of view, the question is whether Lecessne Wells, the African-American modernist, was the first to deploy the trope of doubling between face and mask, and did that make Van Vechten a second-order copyist? Whereas I'm suggesting that we put that approach to one side in light of the intersection that we've just covered between aestheticism and cosmopolitanism, that we put it aside in favor of another kind of research question, an aesthetic of doubling was generative for Afro-moderns as they struggled to break out of the binary code of primitivism in which self and other were discursively fixed as eternal opposites. As we saw before, they had to dismantle that code in order to access ancestral Africa as a third space that would break open fixed relations of domination and subordination. But what if there was also a homoerotic idiom in which doubling found a gay variation in tropes that articulated face and mask to unsettle heteronormative conceptions of identity as well. So I apologize for the poor quality of the reproduction. But like a Venn diagram, we see two sorts of doubling hovering over Jimmy Daniels and Kenneth McPherson with Barté's head of Daniels. It's the portrait um, that Van Vechten produced in 1938. And behind this portrait were complex interpersonal relationships. The Scottish filmmaker Kenneth McPherson on the left was actually married to the English writer Winifred Elliman. But Elliman was partnered to the American poet Hilda Doolittle. 
while McPherson was partnered to Jimmy Daniels, who was a cabaret performer, an actor, and dancer. So at one level then, we're not just dealing with iconography, but with cross-cultural patronage. For where Elliman was known by her pen name, Briar, she commissioned Barté to sculpt the bust of Daniels that we see in this portrait. Such queer patronage also lay behind the 1930 film Borderline, which was Kenneth McPherson's experimental feature film about two interracial couples that featured Paul Robeson alongside HD, Hilda Doolittle. So in Van Vechten's photograph, the doubling that brushes Daniel's brown skin and boyish smile against his own sculpted likeness sets up a kind of mimetic ricochet that is rip, uh, reciprocated by the whiteness of the marble next to McPherson's Caucasian complexion. So we seem to be in the presence of a queer kind of countermimesis, confounding modernism's primal dichotomy between the original and the copy. Placing living flesh and inert stone into a threefold repetition, the question I want to ask, though, is whether we're seeing doubling or is it cloning? Cloning testifies to the primacy of culture as the medium in which identities are made and remade in lesbian and gay contexts, since queers tend to reproduce not in hereditary terms, but through citational forms of copying. Queer copying, in the sense of a countermimesis that subverts an assimilationist quest for normative identity, would logically include the bad copies, the failed repetitions, that have received so much attention in performative theories of gender. If, as I suggested earlier, the iconography of masking in African-American modernism was implicated in hiding something, with the African mask in the still life tableau acting as a kind of carapace for a mournful meditation on the unretrievable ancestral past, then such surface depth relationships may be said to pertain to lesbian and gay strategies of passing and dissemblance. Although the triple repetition in Van Vechten's portrait of Daniels and McPherson's suggests not so much a hidden interior on the part of the interracial couple, so much as the role of artifice in propagating same-sex desire. It's through art, through culture, that modern gay subjects find their ancestors, as it were, and through art and through cultures that they also pass on their brain children, in Locke's phrase. So in this view, instead of asking whether Van Vechten's iconography of faces, marble busts, and African masks was producing a parallel to the doubling of face and mask in Afro-modern ancestralism, the question is how subjects coming from subaltern positions were able to mutually ambiguate modernism's foundational epistemological dichotomy of the original and the copy, which was the binary that attempted to fix the difference in categorical all or nothing absolutes. So thinking of cloning and doubling as idiomatic variants points to the circulation of shared tropes in 1920s and 1930s modernisms that actually validates Locke's anti-proprietorial no, uh, notion of Negro art as a category inclusive of black and white artists alike. But of course, it would be entirely misleading on our part to assume a level playing field. That certainly did not exist. And if we turn to the other side of the Atlantic, we have a case in point for we see two British artists who reveal quite distinct ways of handling the asymmetry of racial difference within same-sex settings. To notice how frequently Glyn Philpott portrayed the Jamaican-born Henry Thomas as his favored model from 1929 to the artist's death in 1937, is to see how well Thomas's high cheekbones, his hair brushed up on a diagonal slant, made for a good fit with Philpott's angular modernism. However, knowing that Thomas was not just Philpott's model, but also his servant, puts matters in a different light. Even as Philpott brought a degree of intimate attentiveness to Thomas that completely went against the grain of the colonial master-servant relationship, the fact that Thomas never looks back, that his eyes are always averted, clearly indicates that this was never a relationship between equals. Socially, this has, could not possibly have been a reciprocal relationship. And yet, aesthetically, the repetition 
whereby the artist returned to his favored model time and again suggests that Thomas's beauty gave him a degree of power within the imaginative space of the artist's studio. So evidence of actual relationships is always an issue when artists are identified as lesbian and gay. Although it's widely agreed that uh, Edward Burrow was mostly asexual, with his queer sensibility coming through mostly in his correspondence with the lesbian photographer and socialite Barbara Kerr Seimer in the 1930s, but also in scrapbooks in which Burrow uh, kept clippings of his favorite cabaret and nightclub performances, uh, performers. Leaving the confines of his studio in the Sussex countryside, Burrow resided in Harlem for a year uh, from 1933 to 1934 producing such street scenes as Harlem of 1934. This is a painting in which two African-American men greet one another in front of a Chinese restaurant with the exaggerated posterior of one man in a long overcoat, highlighting a homoerotic detail whose significance is heightened by the proximity of his hands to the groin of the man being greeted, who's wearing a short bomber jacket. But instead, I've chosen Market Day of 1926, which was produced during uh, Burroughs' sojourn in Marseille in the 1920s. Not just because I'm curious as to why Locke did not discuss Burroughs' work, whose vernacular scenes and stylized figuration have so much in common with an African-American artist such as Archibald Motley. But I've chosen this work more pointedly because the side-by-side -side presentation of the two sailors on shore leave puts sexual sameness into view without recourse to the nude that was the exalted linchpin of gay aestheticism. Unlike master-servant dichotomies of looking and being looked at, the side-by-sideness suggests not so much desire on Burroughs' part of wanting to have as identification, wanting to be, wanting to be like. And in light of the doubling in Van Vechten's photographic portrait of Daniels and McPherson, I find it intriguing that Burrow returned to the side-by-side -side repetition of two black male figures in a much later painting, Newport Docks of 1971, which is also a maritime scene that resonates with the cosmopolitanism Locke put forward in his view as an internationalist of an internationalist black Atlantic. So at the start of the lecture, we heard from Leonard Harris and his criticism of the open secret as an oppressive structure for silencing gayness. I hope that in addition to Jeffrey Stewart's holistic integration of sexuality into our understanding of Locke's work as a cultural critic, my argument for the role of queer aestheticism in Locke's view of culture as always composite enables us to further reframe the pluralistic blackness we find in Afro-modernism's breakthrough moments of the 20s and the 1940s. The open secret is indeed oppressive when everyone knows about black LGBT identities, but the rule is that nobody talks about them. And yet when we adjust our angle of inquiry by just a few degrees, what leaps into view are cross-culturally queer desires, sorry, queer desires, that have been all along hiding in plain sight. So I think hiding in plain sight is a way of reframing the open secret productively. Ebony and Topaz was a lavishly illustrated anthology of poetry, essays, and graphic art, edited in 1927 by Charles Johnson of Opportunity and published under the auspices of the Urban League. Commissioning drawings by uh, Richard Bruce Nugent and Charles Cullen, one might say, all kudos to Johnson. He's really the hero of the story. Johnson's hands-off editorial approach gave contributors artistic license that was independent of any prescriptive cultural program. And in this way, Opportunity's modernist presence in 1920s African-American print culture differentiated itself from the Afro-Edwardianism favored by the crisis under Du Bois's editorship. So Ebony and Topaz really embodies a uniquely intersectional aestheticism. As Caroline Gerser observes in her 2005 essay called Racial and Sexual Hybridity in the Harlem Renaissance, alongside the streamlined um, androgyny of the figures by Charles Cullen, who's a, a white gay graphic artist. This is uh, Cullen's, Cullen's work here on the cover, and that's Nugent's uh, within the anthology. As she observes, 
Alongside the streamlined androgyny of Cullen's figures, Nugent's hermaphrodite figures are, quote, double-raced and double-sexed, enjoying freedom from conventional classifications while participating in a mongrel cultural event that crossed normative, racial and gendered barriers, end quote. And the thing is, Ebony and Topaz was not an isolated case. For the art historical hermeneutic put into place once Locke's aestheticism is articulated with his cosmopolitanism and done so on the basis, on the conceptual basis of his Bosian view of contact as the generative source of cross-cultural fiction, then in that case, our attention is directed more broadly to dance as an Afro-modern contact zone par excellence. That Richmond Barté studied for a while at the Martha Graham studio is as relevant as Van Vechten's standing as the first dance critic of the New York Times. For it's in the black and gay networks that converged in dance during the 1920s and 1930s that we are dealing with a contact zone, as Mary Louise Pratt defines them as, quote, social spaces where cultures meet, clash and grapple with one another often in context of highly asymmetrical relations of power, end quote. So Barté had never actually visited Africa or known Africans firsthand, and he met the Senegalese cabaret dancer, Francois Benga, while visiting Paris in 1934. The illegitimate son of a Wolof family, Benga was a kind of Josephine Baker in reverse. So coming from a privileged class background, he traveled from Dakar to Paris in 1925, actually playing drums for Josephine Baker before he became a dancer in his own right at the Folie Berger. And that's when he took Ferrell uh, as a stage name, really playing on primitivist cliches of untamed Africa. Benga was cast by Jean Cocteau in the avant-garde film The Blood of a Poet, 1930. He was also photographed in New York in 1934 by Van Vechten, but then again by George Platt Lines in 1938 which was the same year that he was also the subject of a painting by Pavel Celicu. So uh, Benga has been portrayed through the lens of five gay artists, Barté, Cocteau, Platlines, Van Vechten and Celicu. The question then is not so much which Benga is the most authentic and the true one, but what the various meanings circulating around the image of his dancing body reveal about black and gay ways of seeing under asymmetrical social conditions. The likeness that Barté achieved in his sculpture is confirmed by photographs in which Benga posed for publicity. But the key feature of Barté's idiom was his classicism, grounded in the aestheticist um, accentuation of the exalted canonical male nude. Drawing from gay aestheticism while being fully attuned to black vernacular innovations in dance, Barté also produced a sculpture called Rug Cutters, which is a depiction of uh, the Lindy Hop, as well as portrayals of ballet dancers in two works of 1934, Calamboine and Weta. So in synthesizing gay aestheticism while being fully attuned to black vernacular innovations in dance, Barté imparted sexual, sorry, sensual vitality to black bodies while deflecting the over-sexualization of racial difference that resulted in the primitivist fetishization of blackness. To say Barté's Africa was mediated through and through by his sources in American dance and American theater of the 20s and 30s is to say then that we're dealing with a problematization of the black body in representational space all of which makes Barté a modernist, channeling black and gay elements into a double-edged ambiguation of canonical norms. So the open secret oppresses when disavowal entails repressive concealment. Yet if artists such as Barté, Cullen and Nugent were not covering up the polymorphous shades of blackness circulating in the 20s and 30s, but rather hiding in the light, do we not see something similar when we fast forward to the even newer Negroes of the 1960s? Fraser was right. It was through mass struggle that civil and political rights were won. But in representational forms that masculinized, that hyper-masculinized the public image of blackness, in the gender politics that came to equate mass empowerment with a regime of representation revolving around stylized acts of macho performance, 
we find that revolutionary black nationalism did not succeed in eliminating the queer subtext that had been on show, that had been hiding in the light in the 1920s, but that the homoerotic aura surrounding black male bodies was merely butched up. Teasing out the subtext to Stephen Shames's 1970 portrait of Huey Newton, just released from prison, Robert Reed Farr spells out the visual pleasure on offer. Quote, dressed only in white car keys, Huey seems to seek intimate connection with his audience, reminding us that, brackets, wink, wink, behind the facade of leather jacket and beret is sensitivity, passion, and sexual prowess, to which even the formal dress of the Panthers gestured while it hid the beautifully undressed body of Chairman Newton from view. Where the wink-nudge element indicates that repression is still very much in play, the historical shift from the 20s to the 1960s presents us there not with a liberation narrative, but with the vicissitudes, the twists and turns of the libidinal economy of desire that subtends all the representational spaces in which subjects are positioned in discourse, readied for action by virtue of the way in which the specular image latches onto the subjective realms a fantasy. So I realize that I'm concluding with a prospectus, which may seem back to front, perverse even from a logical point of view. But then again, ending on a future forward note would be fully in keeping with the optative voice that Locke always favored, a feature of his cultural criticism that Leonard Harris and Charles Molesworth point out in their indispensable 2008 study, Elaine Locke, The Biography of a Philosopher. If we think of the lead that Isaac Julian took in the 1980s in breaking the silence by re-entering the archive, not to look for definitive truths about sexual identity, but rather to reopen closed narratives and in the process rediscover the pluralistic blackness that contemporary artists have inherited from their modernist forebears, then we realize that in the 20th century's closing decades, we merely came full circle. The third turn of the dialectic, as it were, being the decisive moment when the battle of thesis and antithesis, the warring positions in black cultural criticism that had held sway from the 1920s to the 1960s, moved onto a different plateau in the 1980s. And it's on this plane that our contemporaneity distinguishes itself from modernity. It's from this plane that we have begun to engage with the rewriting of modernism's cross-cultural history in light of the aesthetic ingenuity and sheer inventiveness of Afro-modern practices. So to write in the optative mode is to write hopefully about what might be coming next, not predictively, but from a place that understands, as Stuart Hall once put it, how, quote, cultural processes anticipate social change which was the place, I argue, that Locke spoke from in 1949 in the frontiers of culture, when he turned from his reckoning with the past to, quote, the vital present and the promiseful future, in relation to which he said, one important characteristic of the frontiers of culture is that they are always moving, in brackets, not necessarily forward, but at least always moving, end quote. So with the rereading of Locke's philosophy of culture that I've proposed by suggesting how close his pragmatist insights come to a cultural studies approach, one might say that the cultural history of Afro-modernity from 1863 to 2013 is really waiting to be written as 150 years of becoming. Since Stuart Hall is my touchstone, I cannot help but connect Locke's optative disposition towards a future-facing outlook with the view that Hall expressed when he said that, quote, cultural identity is a matter of becoming as well as being. It belongs to the future as much as the past. It's not something that already exists, transcending place, time, history, and culture. Cultural identities come from somewhere, have histories, but like everything which is historical, they undergo constant transformation, end quote. So circling back to the aesthetics of doubling, copying, and photo reproducibility, Rashid Johnson's portrait gallery the New Negro Escapist Social and Athletic Club, his series from 2008, speaks from a place in which it's already understood that the composite culture that once gave rise to the New Negro subject and then to the civil rights subject 
and then the soul subject, or more recently, the post-black subject, is a cultural formation that revolves around endless processes that will, in all likelihood, deliver the Afrofuturist subject to what is yet to come. Where emergent possibilities first make their presence felt in the realm of culture, Locke's insistence on the primacy of culture allows us to understand that critical moves within the composite commons are always ongoing, unfinalized, and in process. So with these conceptual resources in hand, Locke's philosophy of culture guides a hermeneutic for a fresh understanding of Afro-modernism and Afro-modernity, but it may also assist us in investigating the cultural conditions that define the contemporary. Thank you. Thank you. Questions, comments? Okay. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, yes, thank you very much for this um, wonderful lecture again. Um, so I'm kind of struck by um, the many ways in which the you know the black arts movement seemed to have, or the way you outlined it, what are they most kind of rejecting or angry about in Locke? Is you know his it is elitism, his uh, sexuality, his queerness, his uh, disavowal of uh, proprietary notions of cultural production, um, or you know simply the art prioritizing art versus politics, um, and. I'm wondering in terms of the, especially when we think about it in the terms you outlined of this being the next new Negro <laughs> to emerge, how, how has this kind of perhaps misunderstanding of what he was really after or trying to do help uh, define this new kind of identity for them and where you, you find um, the most you know, pointed points of contention were when they look back to what he had achieved? Um, in that sense. Okay, yeah, that's a, a very wide-ranging question. I think what I'm after, or what I want to see happen, is a constructionist account of black cultural history from the mid-19th century onwards. I think too often we fall back on a uh, reflectionist idea of representation, with these artists in the 1920s giving us an accurate view of what real blackness was all about. We don't think like that today because we know that culture produces identities. It doesn't come second as a reflective surface that's merely representing identities that have already been fully constituted. It plays a constitutive role in the formation of identities. So what would a full-blown constructionist account of the multiple positions that blackness um, has uh, instantiated since 1863 look like? I think that's what we uh, can take on board if we think about uh, the anti-proprietorial notion of uh, culture that Locke was uh, playing with, even though, as I say, the big lacuna, the thing that's gone missing, is that it doesn't come ready-made with an account of class conflict, all the uh, missing elements that Nancy Fraser uh, pointed out. Even though this emphasis on um, a composite formation of culture resonates, in my view, very strongly, with Stuart Hall's discursive uh, methods. So I think uh, I mentioned a dialectic, but I think the anger and rejectionism of the 60s um, could be something to revisit and to de-psychologize and to think about if one were to take a constructionist approach to black cultural history. Uh, what I've been suggesting today here was that, that um, that anger and rejectionism produced a sort of hyper-macho black subject that was put forward as the representative of the race. And it's only really in the closing years of the century that we come to the realization, thanks to Isaac Julian and others, that there is no one image that can be representative of pluralistic blackness. If there are multiple shades of blackness, if blackness is not going to be a monolith, there has to be many different types of images, many different types of aesthetic practices. Whereas up to now, with a mimetic model, the argument has been who is right and who is wrong, who got the more accurate correspondence 
between what was being said in the fiction, what was being painted on the canvas, and what was happening in social life. So, um, so I think those are some of the stakes in terms of a prospectus and, and moving forward in thinking about how cultural history can be uh, rewritten. Um, and, and rewritten in the same breath as it decompartmentalizes, which is my point I was making the day before yesterday, so that we don't think of African-American art history as being in a separate corner of its own. It's part of that cross-cultural continuum that African-American artists shared in common with other modernists, whether in Europe or America, that were also engaged with um, uh, African artifacts. So I think reading uh, Locke's philosophy of culture with a more sort of fine-grained approach allows us to loosen up some of our disciplinary attachments to relativize them and to think more broadly about, um, about how humanistic scholarship can be renewed in the 21st century. Why 1863? Emancipation Proclamation the legal conditions for the reconstitution of subjects. Questions, comments? Which picture? Oh, this is a film still from Looking for Langston, which combines archive footage with um, tableau that are filmed in black and white. So these are highly imagistic portrayals. That they're not realistic scenes that are supposed to correspond to what actually happened. They're a way in which we can explore questions of desire and identification through the medium of the image. Uh, this particular scene is set in a graveyard and that links back to the importance of uh, that hauntedness that I was emphasizing in taking a fresh look at the still life genre, the memento mori in which the African mask is portrayed by African American artists of the 20s and 30s. Mm -hmm. Versus the Van Vecten series of uh, artists holding the African uh, of Jadal. Uh, Interesting. I hadn't quite made that connection. Um, yeah, they're both scenes of cross-cultural contact. So that's, that's a valuable point that you've brought out. Thank you, Kovana. I had a question regarding, you talk about the discursive turn, and I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more on, at the end, you talk about more of a sensorial turn. And um, I'm just interested, could you elaborate more on the somatic body? You know, we're seeing Bob Dylan here, we're seeing the dancing um, people. So if you could just talk a little bit more about that, thank you. Okay, um, I think, Paying attention to the materiality of art, our sensory experience of art is not mutually exclusive to understanding its discursive formation. When Stuart Hall was describing Boas yesterday, he talks about the way in language, the way in which language is a symbolic system that imposes intelligibility on the world. We break up the world, which is otherwise overwhelming. It overwhelms the diminutive human by breaking it into little pieces, nouns and verbs and so on. And what we then tend to do is project it back as if those are objective features of the world. They're actually constructions of uh, the symbolic order of culture. But the sensuous and the uh, discursive are not, in my view, mutually exclusive. Although there are many scholars who, for one reason or another, uh, lay out the stakes in, in that way. I've yet to see, a, as I was saying just now, a fully blown discursive constructionist account in African-American art history. So modernism has tended to be thought of in stylistic terms. We think about the elongated limbs of Aaron Douglas's figures. We think about the specular image of Josephine Baker. And we think about modernism stylistically, whereas I'm thinking about modernism as an attitude, a stance or a position that's calling into question what's given. Modernism is an attitude that understands the world is made 
it's not presented uh, uh, for all eternity by uh, nature. And so in the current book project that I'm, I'm working on, that I'm halfway through, Afro-Modernism in 20th Century Art, I'm, study, I'm starting not with an artist, but with Du Bois and with his photographs of 1900 at the American uh, Negro exhibit. Um, and that's partly to underline the value, the insights we get from a discursive approach to pose the question of whether we can see critical strategies, uh, dialogic moves, for, um, and whether we can trace them from one medium to another. So Du Bois is not an artist, he's a social scientist, but what he does with the prognathic angle, the angle that emphasizes the, uh, the, the nose and the forehead uh, in racial phenotype, uh, are dialogical moves that I correlate to the importance of the facial angle in Ethiopia Awakening, uh, the uh, sculpture by Meta Warwick Fuller um, that she completed in 1921. So I'm putting Fuller the sculptor in dialogue with Du Bois and his use of um, photographs as a social scientist to say that there are discursive moves being made by the two of them that make them Afro-modernists, which would be unintelligible or unacceptable from the point of view of those who think only about uh, um, uh, the materiality of the object or the conventional categories in, uh, in which disciplines lay claim to these objects. But I still think that there's a role, to be, uh, there's a role for interdisciplinarity to play. And I don't think that scholars in art history have done, they haven't put their foot down on the pedal hard enough to accelerate uh, what new kinds of questions we might ask by bringing a constructionist approach. Uh, Kobe, I'd like to hear about those photographs in the lecture course that I do with Larry Bobo. And it's very much about a part of the, when I was an undergraduate in the late 60s, early 70s, there are two things that you studied in black studies. One was slavery and the other was the Harlem Renaissance. Um, they were the two touchstones at the very beginning of the, the institutionalization of the field. And we all thought, I mean, for a long, long time, we all thought that the New Negro Movement was the 1920s, but it turns out it's the third or fourth New Negro Movement, right. as Gene Jarrett and I point show. And just by, I, mean, I wanted to just reproduce all these definitions of the New Negro starting in 1894, uh, really. And Du Bois's Paris exhibit, which is at the, um, what we would call the World's Fair now, the Paris Exhibition, um, was very much uh, a part and parcel of that first New Negro movement. Mm -hmm. And what's curious about those photographs, you know, I build it up in my lecture and then show the, the slide. I think they're 363 individuals, mm -hmm. if I'm remembering correctly. And I don't know what percent look like white people, but a hell of a lot do. I mean, they're, they're the most un-Negro Negroes that you'd ever see. And he's making a political statement. He's in dialogue with phrenology, mm -hmm. um, you know, with, race, with racist notions of race. He's trying to deconstruct that. But also he's trying to show Victorian Negroes too, uh, culture bearers in the mm -hmm. way that a Victorian sage would have defined it. It's very complicated, but you're absolutely right. Multidisciplinary, brilliant. But also, you know, he's reflecting his times as well as trying to influence his times like we all do. Mm. And there's a lot of Du Bois that's color struck and elitist and it, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. Um, so I can't wait to see what you do with that. Well, it's not just myself. Sean Michelle Smith has written so insightfully and she sort of offers a different approach in the sense that yes, Du Bois uses the language of eugenics. It's highly disturbing to see these phenotypical representations of blackness. But when he talks about um, uh, white types with Negro blood, Sean Michelle Smith's argument is that he's completely uh, dismantling the coherence of racial types as something that's optically obvious. Racists think that you can, in the blink of an eye, recognize whether someone is black or white. It's as obvious as day and night. And yet these highly ambiguous blue-eyed blonde uh, white types with Negro blood completely muddy the water. It becomes ambiguous. Yes, that's clearly what he's doing. But ambiguation, I think, is part of a broader strategy 
I think we've learned this as a result of post-colonial criticism, and we've learned it as a result of the signifying monkey. When you create ambiguity, you're creating difference that delays and defers the fixity that has previously been constructed uh, in the dominant do discourses. I, I couldn't agree more. And I would suggest that you go back, which I'm, Larry Bobo made me do this, and go back and read the Philadelphia Negro, which is just a year before mm -hmm. the Paris exhibit. But I lecture in relationship to that exhibit on one chapter in uh, Du Bois, in which he defines the five classes of the Negro people. He's always critiquing the idea of a unified Negro mm. uh, conscience. Mm. He's, he's a classist. Whether he was a, the capitalist ca <laughs> classist <Right. laughs> or, or become the socialist communist one, he was keenly aware of class with, with, uh, within the race. Mm. So it's mm, complex signification. It's interesting. Um, mm. It's critiqued, but also it should be critiqued. Right. Right. I know that you all are, this poor man has been lecturing, he's hungry. <laughs> I know he wants some wine. <laughs> I went back and got a plate of food already. Um, but rather than torture him anymore, why don't we join him for food and drink and give him a round of applause. Thank you for brilliant, brilliant <laughs> lectures here. <laughs>